Okay, everybody. So today we're going to be just going through um, what the Bible has to say about Rebecca. Um, and you may not, as far as the, the content of what we learn about her life, you may not learn anything super new or um, different that, than you've heard before. But, um, but we kind of what stood out to me, I kind of want to share um, the things that kind of the lessons I got. I think I've, I've read these passages and kind of um, thought about um, the different things, events that happened and thought of it more as a whole. But then I'm trying to think of, you know, how did she, Rebecca specifically influence um, some of the events in the history of the nation of Israel and some lessons that we can learn from some of the decisions that she made and some of the um, family dynamics that happened. And we'll see that not all of it, a lot of it is pretty actually dysfunctional. And so what can we learn about somebody that maybe that had some good character in some ways and like, like basically most of the Bible um, characters that we, that we read about they have some good qualities and some, um, some even sinful or dysfunctional qualities that we can learn a lesson from and try not to repeat. And so, um, and we can see how things play out conse consequentially from the decisions they make. So today we're going to focus on Rebecca. So let's talk about who was Rebecca. Um, Rebecca was a, the granddaughter of Abraham's brother, Nahor. So she was in that family line. So we're um, still kind of working on, working through the, the era where Israel is being formed. Um, so how does the Bible describe her? We'll see in chapter 24 of Genesis that she was described as very beautiful and she was very modestly veiled. She, you know, she wore veil. She was um, kind of a, we'll see kind of through her character that she was a servant and that she was willing to, um, to do the honorable thing. Um, and then that she even left her family to marry Isaac because Abraham was looking for a good wife for Isaac. And she was willing to basically leave her entire family um, and not really see them again to, to go marry Isaac because she knew that was the right thing. Um, and she was also very much loved by Isaac. Um, she also, I think one of the, the key things to remember is that she played an important role in Israel's history because she's the mother of Jacob and Esau. And also, even though it was kind of a deceitful way, it, it also played a, a role in Jacob becoming, you know, one of the founding um, fathers of Israel. So because of her role in kind of manipulating him, getting his father's blessing and helping him to basically flee for his life um, and be able to carry on the family line that way. So um, we'll see that's kind of an interesting play uh, of, of roles here and, and how that uh, worked out. It's very kind of, kind of interesting how God still worked through that situation, even though I, I thought it was pretty uh, deceptive and not a, not a good way to, uh, to make, to, make sure that your son has the blessing. Okay, so we're gonna look at Genesis 24 and I'm just gonna kind of read through this and then we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what kind of um, interactions happened here. So here, um, Isaac's, um, not Isaac, Abraham is looking for a wife for Isaac. So. Um, he sends a servant out. So I'll just go ahead and read chapter 24 and it's a little bit long. So um, let's see if I can find, I might skip over a little bit so we don't, you know, take so long, but it says now Abraham was old, well advanced in years and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house who had charge of all that he had put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven. You will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaanite, the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to my country and to my kindred and get a wife for my son, Isaac. So the servant is concerned that he won't be able to find someone that would be willing to go with him. Um, 
So he says, basically the test is um, if, and so we go down to verse eight, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from my, then you'll be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So he agreed. He took his camels. He went out there and he, when he was um, in the, verse 11, it said he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was toward the evening, the time when women go out to draw water. So he kind of has this test to see um, which woman will be the right woman. So he kind of asks the Lord to, to help him discern uh, what, which person will be the right choice for Isaac's wife. And he says, let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink and who shall say drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. By this, I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. So before he had finished speaking, there was Rebecca who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. A girl who was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had ever known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar upon her hand, and giving him a drink, she said, Oh, and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the, to, to the well to draw and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So he's basically discerning, okay, now he has to find out if Rebecca is willing, willing to go with him. So she tells him who she is, and um, he says that the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kin. She goes and talks to her family, um, and then he, he tells them who he is. The servant tells uh, Rebecca's family who he is in verse 34. It says, so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become wealthy and he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear saying, you shall not take a wife from my son for the daughters, from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred and get a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. So he's telling him, you know, to, then he tells him that I came to the spring today down in verse 42, and he was looking for someone who would give him a drink. And before he was um, even finished speaking in his heart, verse 45, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder and she went down to the spring and drew. So he just goes ahead and tells her all of the story. Um, so uh, Laban and Bethuel answered in verse 50, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you anything bad or good. Look, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So um, she was willing to be sent to be to go with the servant um, and then she was blessed and it says, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her in verse 60, may you, our sister become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. And then Rebecca and her maids rose up, mounted the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. So we see that, um, she was just so willing to go with him. And then in verse 62, now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out into the evening to walk in the field and looking up, he saw the camels coming and Rebecca looked up. And when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac 
and brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. Um, so, and she was, so Isaac was comforted, comforted after his mother's death. So it was um, the timing of everything. It was God's, I think it was clear here that it was God's will for Isaac and Rebecca to be married. And we see her character is that she was willing to, to follow um, the servant home and to, to do her duty to become Isaac's wife. So there were also three disappointments that Rebecca had in her life. So she had years of childlessness before she had Jacob and Esau. I think it was estimated 20 years. I'm not sure if the Bible tells us that. Um, that was something that I read, that it was about 20 years. So Isaac loved her a lot to be able to wait that long, kind of um, similar. There's some similarities to Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's marriage here. Um, and then when we look at Genesis 26, 1 through 11, we see that another kind of another parallel to Abraham and Sarah is that Isaac lies to um, lies to uh, Abimelech, I think it is, and and tells her him that she is his sister because he thought that they might kill him if um, if they knew she was his wife. So that was interesting that that kind of repeated itself. So you can see some generational patterns here. And then the other disappointment was, um, I don't know if I call this really a disappointment, but more just something that she did that was, um, that would just did not turn out for the best necessarily, even though we know that God worked through that situation was that she had favoritism, um, between her two sons. And so she had one favorite son, Jacob, and then her husband favored Esau. And that led to a fracturing of the whole family, which, um, which was very difficult and kind of devastating to the family somewhat. And so we kind of see that Rebecca had some things in her life that were difficult and that maybe some choices she made led to um, some consequences that, um, that were less than than ideal. Um, so kind of a, a thing to focus on, a focus verse here that gives us an, a, an idea of um, kind of the, the family dynamic that's going to be hap happening when, from the beginning, um, Rebecca, before she had her sons in the womb, uh, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger, which is uh, very much against the customs of the day. The older son was supposed to be, to have the blessing and the birthright and to be, kind of, to be, have authority over the, the younger one. Um, so, but we see that actually Jacob steals that. He is actually the younger from Esau. Um so Rebecca, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, um, they're a family now after, um, and, but we see even from the beginning that, that there were some issues, um, between it, Jacob and Esau, there was even animosity between them in the womb, which is, you know, that's a pretty early start to having siblings for sibling rivalry, uh, 25, 22 through 26, the children struggled together within her. So while they're still in there, they're like fighting in the womb. Um, and she said, if this is to be this way, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, we just read two nations are in your womb and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. After his, afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Isaac's heel, so he was named Jacob. So he took, he took his heel, he, and so Jacob means he supplants. Isaac was 60, 60 years old when she bore them. So we see they were already kind of at odds, even as in the womb and as babies. And so we also see there's a big difference. There are pretty much opposite looks. Um, he saw his red and hairy and Jacob is, I think he has more smooth skin and is, has, they, they also both have 
really different personalities we see in verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. So they were, they had different interests. Uh, one was more outdoorsy and Jacob was more quiet and, and indoorsy, I guess you would call that. So because of that, I think it, it caused you know, Rebecca favored Jacob and Isaac favored Esau. So the mom related more to Jacob and being more quiet and in the tents and in the Isaac um, favored Esau because he could, you know, do things like hunting together and father son type things. And, but this wasn't really considered a good thing because this we'll see as this goes on, this favoritism caused competition between the twins and this ended up fracturing the family ended up having Esau having to move far away from the family or Jacob had to flee Esau um, getting wives from other other groups so um, there's a lot of issues that happen um, as this kind of escalates um, so Rebecca and, and we we can't say it was just Rebecca I think I think Isaac contributed to this but here we're focusing on Rebecca and so she played a role in and um, Jacob and Esau's rivalry. So we see that um, because of this lack of love for Esau uh, and favoritism toward Jacob, Rebecca plotted a scheme to get Isaac's blessing for Jacob instead of Esau, who was, as the eldest, he was entitled to the blessing. So we see that um, in Genesis 27, um, Rebecca helps Jacob get the blessing. I'm sure we're, we're mostly familiar with this story, but Basically, um, she Rebecca schemes to help Jacob dress up as Esau, put goat hair um, on him and make him feel because because Isaac really couldn't see very well at this point. So he goes in and in before Esau, she's kind of watching and seeing um, how this is playing out and kind of making sure that Jacob goes in before Esau to get the blessing he steals that. And as we know, Jacob had already basically manipulated Esau into giving him his birthright because he came in and was so hungry that he sold his birthright to Jacob for a cup of stew. So um, I think we're all kind of familiar with that story too. Sorry, I'm skipping over a lot of details, but this is kind of, there's a lot to these passages. Um, and so we see that as a result of Jacob taking both Esau's birthright and his blessing, that Esau became so angry with Jacob that he planned to kill Jacob. So Rebecca, you know, of course, doesn't want her beloved son to be killed by her other son. And so she helps him. She comes up with a plan for him to, to escape. She finds out about it before Jacob does and says in verse 42, uh, 27, 42, but the words of her elder son Esau were told to Rebecca. So she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran and stay with him for a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger against you turns away and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? So she, so she kind of makes a plan to help him escape. And this, this plays a role in, um, so she, we see first, she kind of, she aggravated the whole thing with her plot to get the blessing. She, she caused the problem and now she's having to remedy it. And it's less than ideal for him to have to leave the whole family and go stay with his, his uncle, um, in a different land. And she, you know, she doesn't really get to see him. Um, she also is grieved. We see that, um, that, that Esau's wives were kind of a source of grief to the family. Um, and so they were Hittite women. And so in, in 27, 46, uh, through 28 too, she's very concerned that Jacob marries someone that is not a Hittite woman. That's a good woman. Um, of their land and family. So then Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the Hittite women. 
If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women, such as these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? So they're a big problem to the family. So we kind of see, you know, there has been further uh, conflict in the family because of that. And then we get to chapter 28 and it says, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him. You shall not marry one of the Canaanite women. Go at once to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as a wife there one from there, one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So he's, he's got to go to a different area and find, um, find a wife over there. So he's, he's having this conflict has escalated to the point where Jacob has to flee for his life and he has to go live in a different land and find a wife over there. So, um, there's just all kinds of conflict and turmoil here in this family because of this rivalry that has been aggravated by both parents. And at this point that, um, that just, it's really fractured them. Um, and see the ironic thing about this a little bit ironic, I guess, is the favoritism has kind of led Re Rebecca to, to being separated from her beloved son. And we don't really know from the Bible, if Rebecca ever saw Jacob again, after his flight, um, it's kind of assumed that he didn't return home until his mother's death. So ultimately that, that led to her being separated possibly till the end of, to never got to see him again. So um, certainly at least was mostly separated for the most of the rest of his life, have, living in a different land. So that was kind of a big consequence of all of this. So, um, Finally, we're just going to talk about some of the lessons that we that we learned from this story. I know there was kind of a lot of different events going on here, and, but I think this was kind of the thing that I found um, interesting. Um, some good points that I found from reading these passages and and re looking examining Rebecca's life and the things that we know about her from the Bible. First, we see that character is of utmost importance when selecting a spouse. So we see that when the servant went out to look for a spouse for Isaac, he was looking for someone of character. And the way he found that out was someone that was willing, um, someone that was, um, was a servant, someone that was, that was willing to go with him and follow what the Lord had had planned for for this event to happen and someone that was attuned to what the right thing to do is. So that's really an important, important key is that when you're looking for someone to marry, um, even though we don't, we don't do it this way anymore in our culture, obviously, but this is something that we can apply is character is, is one of the most important things we can, um, look for when we're selecting someone to marry. That's very important. Um, so we also see that loving our children well is very important, but favoritism is not a good thing. So Rebecca loved her, loved her son, but she favored one over the other. And that really caused you caused disunity in the family. And there's a ton of conflict over it um, and almost led to a murder. So uh, we can see that favoritism is not a good thing when it comes to parenting our children. And so we have to really guard against that and make sure that we are, you know, we're, we're together um, investing in all of our children. It's also important for parents to communicate well with each other and be unified on how they parent and relate to their children. And I think we see that it seems like um, in this marriage, it's hard to, you know, some of it's speculation, but Isaac and Rebecca, you know, it was kind of like, Rebecca, I'll take Jacob, you take Esau. Isaac and they didn't really communicate well and they didn't um they weren't intentional on how they would both love and train up their children together it seemed like they they each took a kid and that led to to some major conflict and problems in the family we can also see that deceit can destroy a loving marriage and family because Rebecca was very deceitful in the way that she plotted for for Jacob to take Esau's blessing. And sometimes the consequences for that, for that can be, can last for a lifetime. So for the people that are involved there, so we saw that basically they didn't get to see their son anymore. And that's, you know, for a parent that can be really, that's really devastating. Um, 
but we also, I think through this story, see that God can still work through bad family situations to accomplish his will. So we see how imperfect this family is. We see how kind of sad the story, sadly the story in it, even though we do see later that Jacob and Esau did reconcile, but I think for their parents, it was um, probably pretty heartbreaking to just have their son leave. And we, like we said, we don't know if, if they got to go visit or anything like that, but it, it was not the ideal. That wasn't what they were um, hoping would happen. And of course they didn't hope that one of their sons would be so angry um, and hate his brother so much that he would try to kill him at some point. So I think we can see how, how God turned the situation around. He, you know, he formed the nation of Israel through Jacob and he also was able to reconcile the two brothers, even though it was not an ideal situation. So I think we can see that, that God can still work through, um, those situations that are just less than per in, less than perfect and through people that are less than perfect. So those are just some things that we can think about. And now um, we can have some time to, to discuss those things. So if anybody has a, let's stop sharing. Okay. So if anybody has a question or comment, you can raise your hand and we can go through and and discuss. So, um, Richard, you got your hand up. I was just thinking about, it's interesting to me, the timing that went about in all of this in um, Rebecca's life with Jacob and Esau. Um, and, and you can extrapolate that out uh, and look at what happens to Jacob later where, you know, he's tricked um, by Laban and ends up marrying Leah. And then, in, and then later ends up marrying who he really wanted to marry was Rachel. And if you think about it, um, all of these things are lessons in, in our life struggles. But the thing about it is, is if Jacob had only been, if he had been allowed to just marry Rachel, he would have had two children instead of 12. So the, 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 the Israel would have, would have literally been a tribe of two instead of 12. Uh, so when you see these things and, and, and because of the, all the conflicts and stuff, so, cause, and I'm reminded, and I know this is, I don't want to detract from what we talked about Rebecca, but it's funny how, uh, these wells that were the uh, Abraham servant met Rebecca. Well, it, when you go into the fourth chapter of Mark, you find a woman at a well that Jesus meets mm -hmm. that was Jacob's well. And so when you extrapolate all that out and you look at from the beginning to the ending of it and see what Jesus was talking about with that woman and the, the interesting conversation he has with her about the purposes of what's going on with what God really wants to take place uh, in, in all of our lives. And you look and you go, wow. But see now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the woman at the well was, a, uh, was Jesus's first evangelist, basically, when you really look at it. So these women played a vital role in, in the forming, the structure and the forming and the purposes and plans of God and for Israel and mm -hmm. literally for the entire world. So uh, those, those are my comments I wanted to make about that. I think it's really interesting how God gave us the free will, but yet we still follow, you know, because he knows the intentions of our hearts. And he, you know, he knows what's going on in, inside of us. He knew what Rebecca was thinking. 
he knew how Rebecca favored Jacob over Esau, you know, and how the dad, and it's always the, the last will be first in the, you know, so I, you know, that, those principles are all there. And it's just really interesting how uh, God chose that woman to be the, the mother, uh, basically, of Israel. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good points, Richard. I think it's really interesting that I think one of the main things I was wanting to share was just how she played into that whole story as a whole, not so much, you know, I'm focusing on one individual at a time, but we're seeing how, and it, it's kind of how our lives play out is we have, we're one person, but we're part of a bigger story and how God just works through that. So it's not about any one person, but we are all playing a part in that. So it's really interesting to see how God works through all that, even through all the imperfections and just bad stuff, really bad stuff that happens in the Bible. So I just find that fascinating. So thanks for sharing your insights on that. All right. So we have Jackson. Go ahead, Jackson. Yeah. Um, fascinating to think about some of the stuff Richard was sharing on how this trickles down generationally. And, um, you know, I haven't really, I haven't read or thought about the Isaac and Rebecca story for a long time. And, um, and it's got me thinking now because I've got several years of parenthood under my belt at this point. And, (laughs) and I'm just thinking like, wow, yeah, that would be just kind of a nightmare. Um, Something I I haven't really thought a lot about until we were going through this just now is I don't really know how to describe it because it's almost something Hannah and I haven't really even talked about in any sort of official way, I suppose. But it's like, as I'm thinking about this story, I realized that Hannah and I sort of function, I guess she can speak to this too and give her side of the perspective, but it feels like Hannah and I have always functioned with this underlying principle that we will operate. Well, anyone who's like read the book um, by uh, what Jocko Willink, Extreme Ownership, it's like Hannah and I function on a principle of extreme unity, (laughs) where it's like, we will make decisions and come to agreement on things and figure that out between ourselves in everything. Like that's just, it's just kind of like a, we, we just, I don't know. I don't know how to exp- explain it any other way, but we just don't allow things to become, well, I just, I just disagree. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and I'm just thinking about how that all plays out into like the kids and everything. And I'm just thinking like, yeah, like how, you know, Laura, as you're talking about this, it's like, you know, Isaac and Rebecca both have this part to play where they're, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's like, who else can you, can you lay the blame on for creating tension in the family? And then, eventually creating certain type of tragedy. I never thought about that. What you shared that like Rebecca and Jacob were like basically estranged because of the things that played out. Right. Which is super sad when that's your favorite child. (laughs) What's the last thing you would want to be estranged from your favorite child. Right. So really, really interesting stuff. And um, I don't know, it's got me thinking like what, what, um, how would one describe the lesson from this in like a in like a marriage or parenting principle you know um and uh so yeah it's got me thinking about that anyway very cool thank you yeah thanks jackson it would be interesting if we had a little more information about how that dynamic worked on like a daily basis so we could learn from it and it sounds like it was kind of it seems kind of pretty unhealthy but there may be more to it than that but it it, it escalated for sure (laughs) Um, but thanks for sharing that, Jackson. Um, Sean, you're next. Yeah, I was just reflecting on um, the role of the servant in this story. And I was thinking like typologically, the servant could be like the Holy Spirit and um, trying to arrange this, this union. And um, Rebecca starts off so 
amazingly obedient because um, the people just ask her, you know, will you go with this man? And she says, I will go. And it's just like, typologically, she's just totally in obedience with the leading of the Holy Spirit. But then as the years unfold, like you've, you've just um, gone through, sin kind of creeps in and it's like that level of disobedience falls away. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a uh, sobering kind of picture that she, that she went from those levels of just, it seemed like just, she heard the Holy Spirit, I just need to go and do this. And she didn't even know the situation she was going into or anything. And uh, that just lovely obedience. And then, you know, by the end of it, it's like a bit of a tragedy, really. But yeah, that was all I was thinking. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, it is interesting because you see the little bit of the demise, not super, I don't know, just how her character kind of declines a little there. Yeah. Fall back. Yeah. She turns to deceit going from super... So that's something to be learned from. Don't think that you, you know, you won't if you don't keep keep being obedient and and, and all that. You can you can turn that way. So good thoughts. Sergio. Yeah, just um, a couple of things that came to my mind <clears throat> when you were teaching. First of all, thanks for the for the teaching. Um, but one of the things that came to my mind was, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, but because of human nature, I think it tends to become a bad thing. I think we just naturally favor whoever is more like us, whether they're our kids or not. Um, but the problem is when you support, when you need to reach out to somebody, specifically your children, who's, who maybe isn't like you, um, and that's where the issues start to, I think, start to come. And, I, and I've seen that in virtually every family. If you have more than one kid, one of them tends to be more like the mom and one of them tends to be more like the dad in, in general. Um, not always, but, and so, you know, it's easy to, you know, reach out to somebody who's more like you. It's a little, it takes a little more effort, a little more of a, of a godly heart or a little more sacrifice to a certain degree. Okay, this this person's not like me, but I can still love them um, and, and, and love my children equally. Or, you know, maybe if it's at work, your coworkers, it's, maybe if somebody's not like you or, or, some, or a neighbor, whoever, um, to, you know, get out of our comfort zone. So that came to my mind. Um, and then the other thing that came to my mind, I remember, I think, uh, last year and the year before when I was reading through um, uh, first, I think it's first and second Kings and it's first and second Chronicles as well. I thought it was really interesting that the King's mothers are often pointed out. I don't, I don't think it's every time, but oftentimes it is. And a lot of, not always, but a lot of times so the good Kings had a mom who was, who was righteous, who was godly, who put good things in them. And I'm specifically thinking of like, I forget who it was. Uh, like you, you talked about the importance of seeking out, you know, a godly spouse. And like, I don't know, I forget who Ahab's dad was, but he messed up <laughs> real bad when he, you know, tries to make an alliance and puts uh, Jezebel in his, in, uh, in his life. Um, there's, there was consequences often when you see a, when, an, when a king had an ungodly mother and, and obviously the father is very important as well. It's not just one parent or the other, but I just thought that was really interesting that the, that, um, that the Bible would point out, um, you know, whose, whose parents, the parents of, of these Kings. And, and obviously then you can look back and see the, the effect they had on them. But uh, thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Sergio. Those are some good um, insights to think about just the influence that we can have as parents and how that might affect, you know, really affects our children that you're, you know, so we have to be thinking about that. Those of us that are parents or um, even just the people we influence in our lives. So it's really good to be, to have that in mind. Um, Steve and Phyllis.
Wow. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, this is a good teaching. And um, as I uh, really listen to it and look at it, um, I'm trying to see in terms of the kingdom of God and the principles of it, not just the term kingdom of God, but the components of the kingdom of God, those foundational uh, specific things. What do I see in this story that um, how I can view this in a kingdom perspective? And um, as you said, Laura, um, it's not just about one person. It's about us, but we are all part of a bigger story. And I think part that bigger story is how we all fit and how this all comes together in terms of the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm seeing God's omniscience for one thing here, his sovereignty. All of these are components, uh, foundational things in the kingdom of God. I'm seeing his, his faithfulness and uh, uh, his righteousness. You know, these are all things we've been learning about the kingdom of God. And this is standing sure, regardless of what mankind was doing, of what uh, Isaac and uh, Rebecca were doing. And that again, just shows us his faithfulness. And as Jackson was uh, given the example of, you know, husband and wife, and we're, it's like we're functioning with these underlying principles, you know, without calling them principles of the kingdom. They really are kingdom principles. Um, it's not just about me saying the word kingdom every time. It's using those components of the kingdom and seeing it. That's what helps us, I think, be able to apply it to everyday life. It is not a religion. It's a way of life. It's God's way of life. And so uh, that was just another perspective. And, uh, and again, thank you. You've given me uh, a lot to think about. Oh, thanks, Phyllis. I, I think Steve had something. I'd just like to add, uh, you know, two, two things here. Uh, in that culture, the firstborn son had birthrights. But because of that he did not see the importance of the birthright. And his younger brother and his mother did. And he was so uh, easy to give it up, to give up uh, uh, something so, so important for a bowl of soup or porridge or whatever was saying that the things of God the spiritual things is less important than the physical things. And he, he made a choice. Isaac and his mother saw the spiritual things and they made a choice because they saw the importance of it. We also get a thing here too, is where we see how this division brings in anti-Semitism. And this has kind of fumbled itself all the way down through you know, the generation pitting one against the other back and forth, one nation against the other nation, one people against the other people. But you know what we have to look at is that when this started, these were two brothers that came out of the womb at the same time. That's all I had to say. Yeah, those are some good thoughts, Steve. I think that that does show us maybe why God chose Jacob because he had that that long-term vision in mind where Esau was very just in the moment, like I need to, I just care more about worldly earthly things. He's not going to be, he's not going to be a kingdom person, I guess. And then Phyllis, you, you also brought that you always bring it back to the kingdom and that, that helps us to apply it to life in the, you know, the kingdom way of life. So that was both some really good, helpful comments. I'm going to go to Randy and then we can, um stop the recording and then continue discussion if we want but go ahead randy 
Okay. Hey, thanks, Laura, for interesting sharing. I hadn't read this story for a while, and so it's a good reminder of, as was pointed out, some of the types that we see, uh, you know, when Eliezer goes and finds a wife uh, for Isaac. You know, Eliezer, the name in Hebrew means God is help. So it's kind of like, like you were sharing, Sean, about the helper <laughs> going out to prepare the bride for, for the Lord. But I, I always wondered about this um, in Genesis 25, 22, you know, when the children struggle together in the womb of, uh, of uh, Rebecca. And the Lord said that there are two nations in your womb and the two people shall be separated from their body. Uh, from your body and one shall serve the one people shall serve shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger and uh it's interesting this was like a prophecy to uh to rebecca but you know did she share this with her husband with uh isaac i don't know but it seemed like isaac would have readily wanted to give the blessing to his son who as was shared, kind of fa he favored that sort of lifestyle or he liked the taste of game. <laughs> so he he sort of put kind of a natural um, tendency before the promise. And, um, you know, but Rebecca, she saw the promise that God had made or that, you know, that the younger was going to serve the older. And so she put a lot of value on that as was shared. And so uh, but Esau, I don't know whether he ignored that or he thought, well, no, I, you know, I'm just going to go with the natural way and the older will be, will get the blessing. And even the way why he chose the older was just because, you know, he liked, uh, he liked the taste of game and, and actually, and Isaac was kind of blind, you know, when he gave the blessing. So he's kind of his spiritual senses. I don't know if that's a type as well, that he wasn't spiritually sensitive to what God was wanting to do. And so he, you know, he just favored the natural over the spiritual. And, uh, you know, as Phyllis was sharing, this is the typical kingdom problem, you know, that we could we could favor the natural over you know, the promises that God has made and who he's called us to be. And uh, so when we look at ourselves that way, you know, it's not what God wants in our life. And uh, so anyways, just wanted to share that whether Rebecca ever shared the promise or the prophecy with uh, with Isaac, because it seemed like Isaac was just dull and he wasn't, uh, you know, paying much attention to it. Maybe he didn't honor his wife and thought, you know, that's ridiculous, and I'm not going to put any uh, weight on that. And, it, and it's sad the way, you know, did did Rebecca have to, you know, resort to these kind of tactics to get uh, the blessing for her son that he that he she knew would be the you know the younger who would be the prominent one that God has chosen. And so it's kind of sad that it had to work out that way. But I think if if Isaac was more spiritually attuned to what the Lord was after, you know, then then it would have been a much simpler way. So maybe they weren't sharing, <laughs> sharing that much uh, in their family or something like that. But uh, Isaac could have been more attuned. There still would have been a problem because I think it would be harder for the older son to accept that the younger son is going to be the prominent one. I mean, that's always the problem with the, you know, the flesh versus the spirit, just like, uh, you know, in Isaac's life, Ishmael and Isaac, that same kind of persecution that could have occurred. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's kind of a sovereignty mixed in with all this, but it's kind of weird that it has to be done in such an underhanded way. And, uh, you know, maybe yeah. God could have had a more peaceful way of, of working this out. But maybe if we force things to happen, uh, we can get into a lot of trouble rather than just kind of waiting for the Lord to uh, work out what he has promised in our lives. Something like that. Yeah, really good insights, Randy. I think that's so interesting that maybe they just were thinking two totally different ways. Like Isaac maybe was more like walking by the flesh and Rebecca walking by the spirit, even though she played it out in such a right. like deceitful way. I'm like, I don't get it. How did God make the situation work out like that? So it's, it's kind of like the mystery thing where you're like, I don't know how God 
works through all this stuff, but it's really interesting to think about. Well, it's kind of like David and Bathsheba, such an underhanded thing that he did. And yet God, you know, uses that line to bring about mm -hmm. the Messiah. Like, it's very strange yeah. that he, he can work even through our weakness. Not that we should, yeah. you know, put the Lord to the test and say, well, I'm right. going to do this sinful thing. But still, we know yeah. that God has worked in our lives despite all of our failures and, and these kinds yeah. of things. It is encouraging to some degree. And then yeah. it inspires us to do better and work with yeah. him more cooperatively. So thanks for Amen. sharing. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but we can continue discussing if we want. All right. And if you're watching on YouTube, please join us sometime. We'd love to have you.